Um, well, welcome everyone to the Cahaba River Society annual meeting. I'm Julie Price, board president for 2021. It's really wonderful to see so many members and partners joining today. Um, I, I do wish that we were in person. I think this is our second year on Zoom, but it's wonderful that everybody's taking the time from wherever they are to join us. The society is emerging from COVID even stronger. We have so many um, new programs, expanded programs, and greater, greater impact than ever before because of your support. Um, if you'd like to see the meeting agenda, it will be posted in the chat. First, we'll have a brief business meeting to elect our new board members, and it's about the best slate I've ever seen. We're going to honor Gordon Black, who's retiring uh, after 15 years devoted to the Cahaba. We'll tell you what we've achieved in education and volunteer programs that he's led, and we'll celebrate a transition to new leadership in the areas that he's um, covered for us. We'll share with you also what we're learning about water equity issues in our people shed and the impacts of climate change on the river and how we're tackling these with hope, exciting, actionable hope. When we complete the agenda, um, we invite you to stay with us for a question and answer and open conversation with whoever remains until around 1.30 if you're able. Um, and then a few housekeeping Zoom logistics. Please, um, we ask everyone except for the speakers to stay on mute. If you'd like to ask a question, you can post that in the chat box and we'll address those as we can. Um, also watch the chat for relevant links for more information and to tell us if you're having any technical issues. Again, huge thanks to Katie for running this meeting and all the Zoom work that she's done to keep us running over the pandemic time. We're also recording the meeting and we'll make it available later in case you miss anything or wanna share with someone else. Now to lead us thoughtfully into our time together today, I'm thrilled to invite our incoming board member, Adam Vines, to read one of his poems. Adam is a director of creative writing and he's an associate professor of English at UAB. Much of his poetry is about nature and his upbringing in Alabama coal country. And we're glad he's strengthening the society's embrace of the arts by joining our board. Adam? Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, this is a poem, uh, one of those gift poems. I've only had a couple in my life where I sat down to write and I was at the place where I was, uh, that I was writing about and it, uh, it, just, it just presented itself. So there was very little revision here. Uh, this was written on the Warrior River. River politics. I spit my smack, Jim slugs his jack, Rob stews his lack, Carrie prepares his rack. Herons hunker on blowdowns, deer wait on high moon, the rounds, and the campfire might as well be an, an empire. We all watch dissolve in the slew, a carp roll, a splash into ash. Thank you, Adam, for uh, that poem, and uh, we'll we'll circle back in just a second. I, this is Anthony Overton. I am the new incoming uh, president for uh, CRS. But before I begin, um, there's <clears throat> some specially deserved thank yous to go out, particularly thanking uh, Julie Price for uh, leading um, our board and CRS uh, for the last <clears throat> year. <clears throat> Again, this was a, a COVID year, and as uh, you know, it presents some challenges and difficulties. <clears throat> but Julie did it so gracefully, and um, I just want to thank her. And I just want to give a kind of formally introduce myself. I'm Anthony Overton. I've been with CRS for several years. I'm currently the chair of the uh, Biological and Environmental Sciences Program at Sanford, and I'm looking forward to becoming uh, the incoming president for 2022. But again, I, we are so grateful for Julie's past leadership. She inspired us, uh, poked us, I and mean, just really did an excellent job, just uh, uh, really displayed many of the qualities of uh, an effective leader. And I think it has uh, led to CRS being in a very good position uh, right now. So uh, let's give her a virtual round of applause for her work. Thank you, Julie, and I, it was, it's a pleasure following uh, your footsteps. I'm having a, to take some mighty big steps, but I'm looking forward to it. But thank, thank you again. You. 
Thanks, Anthony. It was yes. wonderful. So I do have a special gift for you, though. Uh, in the tradition of CRS, this is a virtual. I have a paddle for you. All right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pass this paddle to you virtually. Okay. Oh, right, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anthony, thank you so much. It was um, an incredibly fulfilling year, and it was such a privilege to get to work with everybody and get to know so many members of our board and our staff and bring on new staff members. And I think the highlight of the year was when you said yes to being the next president. I know it's gonna be a fantastic year. Um, we're all delighted for you um, to lead the board um, right. in 2022. Thank you very much. And I'm I'm so ready for COVID to be gone. I mean, this we've, we've had some relationships form over our virtual meetings and hadn't had very many opportunities to get together face to face, but I'm looking uh, for that moment to, to, to reoccur. Okay, thank you again, Julie. And I'm certain I'll be calling you or texting you multiple times for advice. Um, this leads us to our, um, elect, our, our board elections. As you know, CRS is structured such that it has an executive board that helps to guide the direction uh, and the future activities of CRS. And so first I wanna recognize our current board of directors. Uh, for those of you all who are uh, currently on the board and uh, working hard, will you at least raise your hands and just kind of wave with a virtual wave? Thank you. And if, if you are a current CRS member and like to get involved, I mean, just connect with any of these board members. I can assure you, I mean, there's some very talented folks and folks that really care about the, the Cahaba River and those people in this watershed. And it's really nice to be around folks equally yoked and have and be so passionate uh, about our, our, our environment. So um, unfortunately, everyone can't stay on the board forever and we have our, our terms, although we'd like for, for many of them to stay, we just can't, I mean, that's just not the structure. So I wanna thank some of the board members who are rolling off uh, particularly Robert Pless, uh, Stan Ellington, and Melody Ratcliffe. And I want to thank you for your service, and we'll be bringing you your board service award very soon. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure. I'm certain I'll see you around, but you know, even though you're not on the board, you're more than welcome to provide your input because we really value uh, uh, your time and effort and passion for the Cahaba. So just as board members roll off, we have to elect new board members. And uh, we really think about the composition of the board members in terms of um, what they bring to CRS in terms of their talents, their connections, their passion. And so um, the CRS will elect bo every board members at our annual meeting. And so it's time to uh, provide this vote. So I was honored to serve as the head of the nominating committee. And we have a board that keeps growing in diversity to bring us, again, the range of expertise uh, to better represent all of the people uh, that depend on the Cahaba and all of the people within our Cahaba people shed. So we have sent out bios to all CRS members of the new board nominees out in advance. And there's also a link to these bios to our board members and, uh, and nominees in the chat. So I would like to make a motion to nominate our new board, uh, our uh, proposed board leader, uh, board members, Dr. John Burris, uh, Dorikas Cooper, Meg Ford, Craig Neely, Raquel Vasquez, and Adam Vines that we heard from earlier. So uh, I will present that motion to uh, the CRS and that's on the floor. I second the nomination, Anthony. All right, the, the motion has been properly moved and second. I guess, are we ready for the questions? Anthony, can you also, we also need to reelect some of our board members oh, and yes. you have a list of those is there they are. Yes, thank I do. You. Okay, thank you for keeping me on point. I love this group. And that can uh, be in the same motion. All right, same motion. I'm gonna make an amendment to this motion. There are also uh, other board members that need to be reelected because the terms are a bit staggered and this helps to keep continuity with the board. Those members who are up for re-election include Daryl Washington, Ann Tronson, um, Julie Price, uh, Jeet Radia, and Jim McClintock. 
So I would like to add those to my previous motion for uh, to to nominate them on the uh, CRS board. I'll second that as well. All right, thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Second it. Uh, we're ready for the question. All those in favor, I guess, signify with a thumbs up, handshake, or I don't know, hand wave. All right, any opposition? I'm not seeing any, so the motion is passed. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really excited about our new board members. It was as part of this nominating committee, you know, it, we had a hard time selecting members um, because we had so many people who were be well qualified to serve on the board. And that, you know, brings me a lot of hope with CRS because knowing hopefully those same people would be interested in serving at a later point. So we have constantly new uh, people coming to the board that bring in new ideas that would help move CRS uh, forward. So it's been a pleasure. Okay, I am going to pass the virtual floor to our illustrious executive director, Beth Stewart. Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anthony. I am so looking forward to your presidency. Um, so in this first part of our program, we're gonna tell you about the work that we do for education and volunteerism to connect people with the river and inspire them to become good stewards of their waterways in the Cahaba. And for 15 years, our retiring education director, Gordon Black has built these programs to have a big impact. Gordon has been an innovative and very entertaining educator a river guide who inspires just tremendous trust in our programs, my right hand, and a mentor to so many young people. In fact, encouraging young people to become leaders for water is core to our mission. And while I find it very hard to imagine not having Gordon on our full-time team, his retirement has created some opportunities for that youth leadership. And it takes two people to replace him and we're pleased to bring our intern, Will Rayner, on full-time as our field programs director. The first time we've devoted staff to leading and growing our volunteer stewardship program and recreation program. Gordon will tell you more about Will in a moment and introduce him. And I'm especially happy to announce that our environmental science educator who started working for us while she was still a senior at Miles College and has been in, uh, just incredible in growing with us since Latanya Scott has stepped into the role of education director. Congratulations, Latanya. And what's been happening in the CLEAN program? Thank you, Beth. I appreciate this opportunity. <laughs> uh, so even though COVID and unpredictable weather continues to make life very difficult for scheduling CLEAN field trips in our people shed, uh, we have been reaching students with our unique environmental education program in the midst of the pandemic, uh, we have created an online Cahaba story map and over 20 new educational videos that were filmed in the river. And our virtual video library has been viewed over 53,700 times, reaching many students and teachers online in our people shed. So over the past two years, we served 1,309 students and teachers with our clean programs, both on the river when possible, and by presenting our program for classrooms online where students can take a trip down the river virtually. Serving more schools and nonprofits in the Black Belt is an important goal. And we are working with our Black Belt coordinator, Salam Green, and the new Alabama River Diversity Network to connect and build relationships in Perry, Dallas, Bibb County in our efforts to expand our program. It is very important to rebuild our program this year with all the changes that are happening, we will continue to, to con ugh, I'm getting tongue twisted. <laughs> we will continue to serve our people shed with our education, building connections that will last more than just one trip at a school. But we'll see repeat trips over many years. Please get in touch with me if you want to bring clean to your school nonprofit group scout groups, church groups, youth groups, and more. So as we continue to build and promote our volunteer river stewardship program, I feel honored to introduce Gordon Black, who has been our education director for the Cahaba River Society for the past 15 years, and my supervisor and trip leader for eight of those years. 
Gordon will talk to you more about the actions and achievements in our volunteer stewardship. Now, Gordon, as I'm stepping into your waiters, I promise to hold my paddle high with grace and elegance. Gordon, take it away. Well, thanks. When do I get the waiters? Um, before I bring you all up to date on what's going on in our stewardship programs, I want to point out that I'm not just paddling off around the next bend in the river, never to be seen again. I'm not that easy to get rid of. I'll be working part-time this spring to help with the transition to our new team as they find their footing. Our youthful vigor, their youthful vigor, will take our programs to new heights, I'm sure. Meanwhile, I'll be helping Randy on our lily trips, the moonlight adventures, campouts, et cetera. And I hope to S-Y-O-T-R, see you on the river. Please come join us. I wanna thank so many folks for letting me have the opportunity to teach and work on the Cahaba. First to Beth for hiring me and putting up with me for 15 years. Only one person has put up with me longer and she's a saint. To the incredible CRS staff, what a team. We've accomplished so much and had so much fun doing it. To the board of directors, constantly changing but always impressive folks. I've always gotten good advice and guidance from the board. The stewardship committee of our board has been a valuable resource to me in particular. Of course, our generous funders and the society membership are essential to our success too. And last but certainly not least, a big shout out to the volunteers who have put so much energy into helping CRS achieve its goals. Stewardship projects like stream bank stabilization, invasive plant removal, reforesting river buffer zones and cleaning up litter have been increasing and are poised to increase further now that we've added Will Rayner as field programs director. Wave, Will. Um, working together, Latanya and Will will be revitalizing clean after a challenging couple of years, as well as expanding our stewardship program. Over the last year, we had a team of four intern river stewards helping with projects such as developing a stream bank landowner's guide to help folks understand how rivers work and how to protect their property, as well as how to protect critical river habitat and, and water quality. These interns are building valuable skills and experience so they can be the environmental leadership our future depends on. Will will work with new interns, some of whom will come from Miles, Samford, and Swanee Colleges. Plus, he'll work with our corporate and organizational partners, members, and other volunteers to build and expand the whole stewardship program. Watch this space. Things are really going to get good. Back to the importance of our volunteers. Our small staff, committed and effective as they are, even with the new intern program, could not keep up with the dynamic changes and degradation in the Cahaba watershed. So we rely and count on so many parts of society to help with the task. From garden clubs to companies like Coca-Cola United, Spire Energy, PPM Environmental Consultants, from YouthServe to St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, from Independent Presbyterian to the Any Miles Jewish Day School, from individual volunteers who love the river to huge scouting groups, the good folks of Central Alabama step up. I do countless people and organizations a disservice by not mentioning them. But Beth gave me only four minutes. On the other hand, what's she going to do if I go over? Fire me? Will is going to have his hands full organizing all this love for the Cahaba River. He'll do great, and you won't have to do it alone. When we are able, we like to recognize extraordinary individuals doing extraordinary conservation work in our watershed. Talk about organizing. Gene Cox has put together countless cleanups in the upper Cahaba watershed. She and her husband, Alex, have been instrumental in starting a Friends of Pinchgut Creek group. They are raising awareness about the importance and biological riches of this important tributary of the Cahaba in Trustville. They are also advocating for a new park on that creek so that folks can enjoy nature and learn about this incredible place. Jean serves on Trustville's Tree Commission, helping to protect the forests that in turn protect our river. Maybe most important, she has taught her kids to love and care for the river. 
by exploring it year round with them. With great pleasure, I present this commemorative plaque to our conservationist of the year, Gene Cox. Gene, no. <laughs> it's all up to you. Thank you, Gordon. That's so sweet. Um, it, I was cracking up seeing that crazy picture of me holding the turtle. I'm sorry, that's why I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gordon, everything we've accomplished up here, so much of it would not have happened without your help. Um, when I need advice or a phone number, Gordon's who I call. Um, and he's been helping us get things organized up here for a long time. Um, I first met Gordon back in 2018. Uh, we were planning our first cleanup event here in Trustville and I contacted the Cahaba River Society. I had no idea what I was doing. And I asked for some help and guidance and Gordon's what I got. Um, and the day I wanna share a little story with everybody about the day I met Gordon. So, um, Whenever I was on the way to go meet him, I got a call from my kid's school. I had to go pick him up because he was wheezing. So I picked the kid up and all the way on the way to meet Gordon, I was lecturing him, telling him he needed to be on his best behavior because I had really important business to talk to this river guy about. Um, once we got there, it became very clear that Atticus, my son, and Gordon had more important things to talk about. Um, we started walking down to the river. By the time we got to the river, they were picking up rocks and checking out bugs and talking about insects and fish and stuff. And I very quickly became the woman in the background yapping about picking up litter. Um, we've had other opportunities for Atticus and Gordon to float in the creek. I love this picture here in the river, actually. Um, when our first cleanup event was over with, Gordon had worked for several hours um, dragging canoes full of garbage in very shallow water. And he still managed to have enough energy to take my kid on a ride um, down the Cahaba here in Trustville. And it, that was like the highlight of my day. It was awesome and Atticus had a blast. Um, it may have been his first time in a canoe actually. Um, since then, we've worked with Gordon many times on many awesome cleanup events. And it always amazes me, if Atticus is in a boat with Gordon, he has a blast. They talk and talk and talk. Um, Gordon loves to talk, we all know that. So does Atticus, so they're really great buds. but. One thing that Gordon does that makes him really awesome with kids is Gordon listens. He takes the time to hear kids' ideas and he has conversations with them. That's what makes him a really, truly great educator. He makes kids feel important and big. And when you make a child feel big, they will accomplish big things. Same thing applies to grownups too, and I think Gordon knows that. Gordon has helped somewhere around 25,000 kids learn about the river through CRS's education program and through field trips. That's such a huge number. He has, of course, shared plenty of fun river facts with those kids, but he's also shared something much greater with them, love and respect for our river. There is no telling how many amazing things will be accomplished by children that he has taught over the years. How many of those kids will lead conservation groups one day? How many of them will decide to become scientists or river workers because of interest that was sparked while they were on a CRS field trip led by Gordon. The volunteers and CRS staff members that have worked with Gordon have been lucky to learn from such a great example. He shows us how hard we should all work to protect our waterways. He makes us want to do more. He makes us care more. He also really makes cleaning up the river way more fun than it probably should be. If I had to choose between going to a nice party with some of my more civilized friends or floating down the river cleaning up trash with Gordon, I would totally choose the river work, no doubt. Gordon, thank you for all of the millions of piles of, millions of pounds of trash and tires that you have gathered over the years. Thank you for literally keeping us afloat many times. Thank you for all of your amazing work teaching the children about our beautiful river. Thank you for being a great mentor and an awesome friend to all of us. The Cahaba River Society is showing their appreciation to you. Um, Gordon, you are being presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award for all of your awesome work. You deserve this big time and you deserve all those tacky balloons, I love it. Um, we hope you enjoy your retirement, but we know you are still gonna be doing plenty of work. This is so awesome, all these balloons, I love it. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> we love you, Gordon. <laughs> I, I guess it's my turn to say, ah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God.
guys are going to scream. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. This is so fun. I, why, the one day I don't have a, a hat pin. <laughs> Thanks you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> I think Katie's probably trying to get back to her computer now. <laughs> That's great. He is literally covered with balloons right now. <laughs> I am totally. Uh, too fun. Okay, LT, you're up next. Thank you guys so much. All right, so I am one of the co-chairs of our Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee or EDI. And so this has been a tremendous learning experience and an honor to be a part of this wonderful group of folks. So we have conversations that embody values, policies, practices to hear and serve all people including, but not are limited to, those who have been historically underrepresented uh, based on race, ethnicity, location, and more. Our committee completed our equity, diversity, and inclusion statement of intent that was adopted by, that was adopted by the board last year. A link of that statement should be in the chat right now. So if you're interested, please click on it. Uh, we meet monthly welcoming, welcoming people into our conversations, listening to voices from a range of perspectives from professional, government, and grassroots across the people shed. Now, as we continue learning more and more about our people shed, developing ways to take action and address water equity issues, how the information we learn plays an important role in our programs and the diversity of the Cahaba River Society board and staff. In the coming year, we wanna open this up to the community to become community conversations. Next, several of our committee members will share what they've learned and how they feel being a part of this wonderful committee. And let me introduce one of one of our many phenomenal members who will be the first to share his perspectives and feelings on being a part of our committee, Corey Petway. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corey Petway. I serve as a member of the Cahaba River Society EDI committee and vice president of the Alabama River Alliance. I'm a resident of Birmingham and I live within the Valley Creek watershed. It is an honor to share with you the wonderful experience I've had over the last year working with a diverse group of committee members to help draft the EDI statement and commitment uh, for the Cahaba River Society going forward. Over the last year, we've had an open dialogue about uh, several different things and injustices in our environment that we all face. However, we've noticed that a lot of it uh, affected marginalized people. We want to make sure that uh, the Cahaba River Society is intentional about building relationships, empowering and educating people that are most affected by these issues so they can become more involved with the solutions create more solutions and help alleviate problems before they start. I urge you all to continue your commitment and the work that you're doing. I invite you all to join us for one of our EDI committee meetings. Our next one is February the 9th. You can get with Latanya or Beth uh, and they both will share the information with you. Uh, once again, thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to continuing our work together. Have a great day. We've really enjoyed working with Corey and we've learned so much from him. So um, I am um, Beth Stewart, executive director and also co-chair of the um, EDI committee. And you've heard us use the term people shed. We made that up. It's all about the people who rely on the river. So, um, and Katie, can you show those slides? Thank you. A watershed is the land area that collects rain and makes the river. And here's the Cahaba watershed. And we also care about how the river is used and where it goes. 
um, not only our downstream neighbors, but also our downpipe neighbors. The Cahaba is a main raw water source for the Birmingham Water Board, so the river matters to all those customers. Also, sewage from all the Shades Creek communities and many Cahaba communities is piped every day through Red Mountain to be treated and discharged into Valley Creek, which contributes to substandard water quality that affects those communities. So we are one water community and our people shed includes Jefferson, Shelby, Bibb Perry, and Dallas County. We believe access to drinking water is a human right. And one of the ways we are already increasing our equity work is partnering with Birmingham Center groups and Alabama Rivers Alliance to encourage the water board to fund a customer assistance program so that people don't lose water service because they can't pay their bills. We've also learned a lot about flooding impacts and stormwater impacts in Birmingham. And uh, from that, when we wrote comments to, uh, the, uh, to FEMA at the national level as they look to reform the national flood insurance policies, we included equity concerns in that. We're learning about the demographics of our people shed thanks to Dr. Pete Van Zant of Birmingham Southern College. He's analyzing census data for us. And here are two examples of his in-depth work. Can you change the slide, Katie? There's a great, thank you. There's a great disparity in median household income between our counties. That's especially heartbreaking. We serve among the wealthiest and most disadvantaged communities in the state with a range of annual household median income from 78,000 in Shelby County to 23,000 in Perry County. We also are exploring census track level data like this, and change the slide again, on race, income, age, and educational attainment. And all of this is gonna be so helpful to us to guide uh, how we bring water equity into our program work and the diversity goals we have for our organization. Kenya, you're up next. So Kenya is calling in from her class at Montevallo. Um, she's actually teaching a biology class today. Katie, do we have Kenya with us? Kenya is with us. Yeah, spotlighting each person is a little challenging. Kenya, are you uh, off mute and able to speak? Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you all hear me? Okay, they can't hear me because um, we don't have audio on Zoom, so I was calling in. Um, but uh, can you all hear me? I'm gonna have to turn off my phone to do my presentation, and then I'll just come back into the Zoom. That'll work. We can hear you, but not see you, can you? Hello, can you all hear me? Yep, that's great. We can hear you and we can see you. Okay. All right, I'm just going to go and do my presentation. I apologize for the mix up. Um, so class, um, this is the Cahaba River um, annual meeting and we're in the phase where we're talking about water equity. And I apologize for the audio issues that we're having, but I'm going to go ahead and do my presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about access to our watershed um, as a diverse group of individuals. So I wanted to start by talking about water equity and saying that according to the National Environmental Health Association, water equity is defined as the proportional and equitable distribution of water related to environmental benefits and risks among diverse economic and cultural communities. Part of those environmental benefits is to have access to the river and waterways for recreation. Many people of color do not have access to the river growing up because of lack of exposure. I grew up in the West End part of Tuscaloosa, a majority African-American community. The Black Warrior River, which is in my watershed, is about five minutes from where I live. I didn't go to the river, nor did anyone in my family go to the river for recreation. It was only after I became an environmentalist that I learned to enjoy the outdoors and to walk along the river. There's also the narrative that people of color don't hike, swim, and kayak. And I want to change that narrative as an environmental educator. 
I believe it is our collective responsibility as environmental organizations to dispel negative stereotypes around water access and expose more diverse communities to the beauty of our watersheds. I also believe strongly in sharing my personal story of becoming an environmentalist to encourage diverse young minds to learn more about possible career goals of environmental work. So that's my presentation and thank you all for allowing me to speak. Hi, my name is Carolyn Ratliff and I've been on the board for going on, uh, I guess this will be my third year, believe it or not. And it's been a great learning experience for me and really an honor to work with such committed uh, people like Beth, her staff, the board members. Um, I wanted to tell you what my experience with EDI has been after the formation of EDI, um, the committee, Beth arranged for us to uh, have a seminar, a Zoom seminar, which really happened at the beginning of COVID. And we listened to these very knowledgeable consultants talk to us about board development and social justice. And it expanded my world and my understanding of systemic racism. And this was something that I really did not have any firsthand knowledge of. So that laid the foundation for us to begin working on our mission statement. And people talked about their uh, different experiences, life experiences, and uh, listening was a very big part of the process and we came up with a mission statement that we worked on word by word, very thoughtfully considering everybody's, um, uh, again, life experiences and um, feelings and what our goal was, which is to be more inclusive, to take the watershed, take the Cahaba River and expand the access for people and their understanding of um, EDI and our role as um, Cahaba River Society members. So glad to be on this board. All right, I'm Eleanor Delbane and I'm board member emeritus and co-chair of the Cahaba River Society Stewardship Committee. Our stewardship committee's focus is stream bank protection and restoration, including river access and impacting drinking, fishing, and recreation water quality. So I've been influenced by EDI conversations and brought that into our CRS stewardship committee work, where we're now choosing equity, diversity, and inclusion as our first criteria in choosing our projects and we are practicing principles of collaboration in all of our work. Two of our ongoing stewardship projects are the, a model screen bank restoration program along the project along uh, the Shades Creek in Homewood in partnership with Friends of Shades Creek and others. People come from all across the city to this area and its trails. So it's a great place for access uh, by a diversity of citizens. It's also great for educational resources, expanding partnerships, and outreach to communities all along Shades Creek and the Cahaba. Another stewardship project is Camp Fletcher, and there's going to be a bio blitz there April 29th to 30th. And I think we're going to be hearing more about that. And if not, be sure to Google Cahaba River Society bio blitz, and you'll learn a lot about it. It's an opportunity to learn a lot and uh, join us. For me personally, through listening to people's stories in our EDI meeting and reading in an ongoing process of wanting to educate myself, my eyes and ears are gradually opening to a more full, accurate and personal story of the Cahaba and her people's true history. I have much to learn and I'm grateful to be serving on this committee. So thank you all. Hey everyone, my name is Meg Ford. I'm an incoming board member and I'm also Alabama Audubon's Black Belt Coordinator. So I wanted to share a specific way that um, our ED and I work has manifested in my personal work for Alabama Audubon. We recently, at the end of last year, got the opportunity to help reopen along with Cobber River Society and a few other Alabama nonprofits in the city of Marion. Um, we got the opportunity to help reopen Perry Lakes Park in Perry County. 
I hope that you'll get an opportunity to visit it very soon. It's a free and open to the public space with great access to the Copper River and awesome birding. Um, but a part of the reason that it was closed, it was closed for about a year and a half or so. And part of that reason was actually because of ongoing water infrastructure issues at the park and also water infrastructure issues throughout the city of Marion. So you probably saw in the data that Beth shared at the beginning of her presentation from Pete Van Zant that Perry County is in the lower um, part of that uh, median household income slide that she showed. And it's also a majority black community. So um, some of the water equity issues that we've been discussing throughout our time in the EDI committee can be pretty well reflected in the city of Marion in a lot of different ways. So we also got the opportunity to speak to the to Mayor Hinn, who's the uh, mayor of Marion, to talk about those water infrastructure issues and those sewer infrastructure issues in detail. So that gave us a little more um, guidance on our next steps for getting the park reopened initially, but also for keeping it oh, from closing again in the future. But it also just gave me a lot of insight on the connection between water equity and how it can affect birds and how it can affect people and how it can affect wildlife as well. Hey everybody, I'm Allison Manley. Um, what, my takeaway from this year of learning has been that it's so important to realize that what happens anywhere on our watershed impacts all of us, whether it's upstream or downstream, the health of the water we drink and use recreationally affects our soil, our wildlife, and even the air we breathe. Um, we need to strive together to bring a diverse mix of groups from all over the watershed to work together to take care of this amazing resource and make sure its benefits are shared by everyone in our people shed. Awesome. Well, thanks, Allison. Meg and everyone from the CRS EDI committee um, for that great presentation. Hopefully by now you've seen my face or seen my updates in the CRS newsletter, but if not, um, my name is Ben Wegleitner. I joined the CRS team in April of 2021 as the River Sustainability Director. Um, you'll hear from me shortly, but up next in our program, we'll watch uh, some prepared comments from Dr. Jim McClintock on how climate change is influencing the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of Alabama and the Cahaba River. He could not be here today, but we wanted him to share his expertise on this important topic. Jim McClintock is a distinguished professor of polar and marine biology at UAB. His research focuses on the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification on Antarctic marine algae and invertebrates. He's an author, a naturalist, and an angler. Dr. McClintock also serves on CRS's board of directors. More of Dr. McClintock's impressive biography can be found on our website, but first we'll watch this quick video. It's a real pleasure to be uh, the opening speaker today for the annual meeting of the Cahaba River Society. My name is Dr. James McClintock. I'm professor of polar and marine biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I'm also a proud board member of the Cahaba River Society. So what I'd like to do today is talk to you uh, about uh, climate change and from the perspective of uh, the global picture and a focus on Alabama, the state, and then uh, narrow it down to the impacts on our beloved Cahaba River. So let's look at the world as a whole and temperature war uh, changes are occurring. We all know this, the temperature since the beginning of the industrial revolution uh, and the pumping of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that warm the atmosphere has resulted in about a 1.1 degree uh, centigrade increase in the temperature of the planet to date. And these uh, has this has great effects on all sorts of different climate issues. It's not just warming. Um, if you talk to, as I have had the fortune to do, uh, the Apollo astronauts who've been up in space and looked back on our planet, uh, they'll all tell you that the fragility of the Earth is just absolutely astounding. Um, and particularly when you consider the biosphere, this very, very thin layer of life that occurs on the outer portion of our planet. Uh, this biosphere, of course, is now subject to uh, the trapping of heat because of the burning of fossil fuels. And this has the potential to significantly damage uh, our Earth's biosphere. Well, if we focus down uh, from the earth to the state of Alabama, what kinds of impacts are we experiencing from climate change? Well, 
you're seeing quite a few these days. Uh, we're seeing hotter hots, essentially uh, in the form of extreme heat days, uh, colder colds where we have the jet stream plunging deeper than it has in the past and coming all the way down into Texas, uh, Alabama, and South. Uh, sea level rise is occurring. Uh, we're having some coastal flooding issues along our coast. Uh, as the oceans are warming, we're experiencing stronger hurricanes as well. Uh, we have droughts now that have occurred in Alabama at a higher frequency than they used to that have potential impacts uh, on us as well. And then, of course, we have these tremendous rains. Everybody has noticed lately that when it rains, it pours. Uh, it doesn't rain like it used to. And there are impacts of these very heavy rains that I'll talk about more in, in just a minute. So taking a closer look at some of these uh, comments about what's happening in our state, um, if you look at the number of days with extreme heat, uh, that would be in the deep purple here uh, for some of the area around Alabama, these are days where the heat index is well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this uh, reminds me of uh, an op-ed I wrote some time ago, a couple of years ago in 2019, about a, a football game. Uh, Ole Miss was playing Alabama down at Tuscaloosa in the afternoon, and, and I remember discovering that the medics at the football game uh, didn't have enough medical staff to uh, deal with all the people that were having heat stroke and heat issues from this tremendous heat index. Uh, and these hot days, these extreme heat days are becoming more common with potentially significant health effects on uh, people in our state. The Arctic air is plunging further south. Uh, there are days when Alaska is warmer than Alabama, uh, and these temperatures can have a big impact on plants, uh, on some of the invertebrates, uh, on a number of things, on your pipes. Uh, so these are events that have become more common as well. Sea level rise is based on uh, the melting of the Antarctic ice sheets. Uh, many of you know that I work in Antarctica, uh, and the Antarctic ice sheets are melting at a faster and faster rate as the Antarctic circumpolar current is warming and helping melt them. We're also seeing a lot of melt in the Greenland ice sheet as well, and about half of the melting that's occurring is coming from the ice sheets, and the other part of ocean warming. So about 50% from ocean warming, the expansion of the water molecules as a result, and then also the ice sheets melting in Antarctica and Greenland. Here's some data for sea level rise over 50 years, and Alabama is looking at about four to six inches of sea level rise in that period. Doesn't sound like much, uh, but if you have a beach house, uh, that's something to consider as the storms will push the water further and further inland as that increases. We see this already in Miami, where on, on uh, king tides, uh, on a sunny day, you can have water, seawater rushing into the streets of Miami. And look at the west end of Dauphin Island at high tides now, some of these houses, their time is limited. Um, hurricanes are, are becoming more intense, and that's because the ocean is warming. Uh, the most classic example of this of late would be Hurricane Michael, a fairly recent hurricane in 2018 that, that came across the Gulf as a, as a Cat 3. It hit the warm Gulf and became a Cat 4. It hit the panhandle of Florida and, and then took out a bunch of uh, pine forests and plantations in Alabama. Um, and it essentially, when the damage was assessed, was raised to a category five. So it went from a three to a five, largely because the Gulf was so warm. And this is the impacts of climate warming itself on hurricanes. We're also seeing more droughts. Um, Birmingham and Alabama have had increased frequencies of droughts, including this one in 2019 or 2016, where uh, Lake Purdy was almost completely dry. Um, I think we were just several months from running out of water in one of our major water sources for the Birmingham area. And then, of course, not to forget these heavy rain events, uh, which have become exceedingly more common. Uh, I'm not sure we get more inches of rain in a given year, but when it rains, it rains harder per unit time than it used to. And so it, you get this tremendous amount of backup of water flow, and this has impacts on streams and rivers and neighborhoods and lots of different things in that regard. So what are the impacts of these changes in Alabama on the river, on our beloved Cahaba River? Well, we're seeing more sedimentation 
in the water because of the erosion of the banks and the deluge from the rains. Uh, we're seeing sewage transport issues, breaks in sewer lines, treatment challenges at sewer treatment plants, overflow. Uh, we're having drought effects where the river gets so low and warm that you end up with eutrophication issues. And then we're having extremes uh, of climate that could attract invasives and push out the native species. And last but not least, biodiversity, which is challenging, uh, is challenged by warming and sedimentation uh, in the Cahaba River. So looking a little more closely at these issues, uh, here's an image of the Cahaba River in December 27th, 2018. You can see what I call the chocolate water of the Cahaba. More and more days now, chocolate water, where the heavy rains are removing the banks, uh, causing uh, sedimentation issues in the water flow. You're having clogged gills of invertebrates. Uh, so there are biological impacts of this. Uh, and we're going to see more and more as this as the uh, atmosphere gets warmer and holds more and more moisture. Um, overflow of the sewer systems are now becoming more common. Here's here's a an article recently that Jefferson County has launched its first sewer overflow warning system. Uh, so we're seeing this kind of situation impacting the Cahaba River. And these sewer pollutants or wastewater pollutants that get into rivers and streams can have impacts on not only sensitive predators, but also the very food webs themselves that characterize the streams and rivers. So that's something that it needs more study in the Cahaba River, but may in fact be a problem. Um, with excessive heat comes drought uh, and low rain levels. We get a low base flow. This picture of the Cahaba River was taken uh, essentially in an area where there was low flow and the algae is just extremely abundant. It's blooming. When that happens, it depletes the oxygen in the water, kills the, the, the local invertebrates and the fish. Uh, so these periods of drought can be bad news for the Cahaba River. And then of course, uh, last but not least, biodiversity loss, uh, something that's, that's close to our hearts here in Alabama, where we have tremendous biodiversity, unparalleled biodiversity in many cases, compared to other states in our country. Um, three species of fish, the Gulf sturgeon, the Alabama shad, and the southern studfish, they're alive, but they're no longer in the Cahaba. Uh, they've been extirpated from the Cahaba River. Uh, two species that are extinct now, but historically occurred in the Cahaba River are these uh, upland comb shells and the southern comb shell uh, types of mussels. So we have seen some extinctions, and as these climate change impacts become stronger, we're likely to see more. And we certainly don't want to lose biodiversity, not when uh, our state is the home of our guardian of Alabama biodiversity, our beloved E.O. Wilson, who passed away recently, but left us with a wonderful, wonderful legacy of a state that has a huge promise to be protected for many, many generations to come. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim, for those for those very important words and that important message. Um, for the next few short minutes, I'm going to discuss how these climate change impacts underscore CRS's sustainability goals as we work to make our communities more resilient, including the achievements of the last year. Um, but, but first, um, in the last year, we saw multiple of what are considered 100 year, 500 year, and even what was considered a 1000 year storms um, in 2021. And these storms did major, major damage to the Cahaba River, including the catastrophic flooding that happened on October 6th that led to a FEMA disaster declaration. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. As I mentioned, the real impacts of climate change underscore the work of Cahaba River Society is already doing to protect and restore the Cahaba and its rich diversity of life. Our initiatives are meant to mitigate and even reverse the worst of these impacts, which were outlined by Jim and are listed here in red. Um, one of CRS's primary uh, sustainability initiatives and one that really sets us apart in this watershed is the way that we collaborate with developers, engineers, and municipalities to influence the design of stormwater features um, to reduce the post-construction stormwater runoff issues that we've seen historically. 
We're working to change how these stormwater features are designed so that they slow down, hold back, and even infiltrate uh, more of that stormwater to prevent it from reaching the river. We've had some success over the last year with builders in Irondale, in the Stavia Hills, and in Hoover, influencing at least six project designs in 2021, but clearly there's more work to be done. We're also targeting uh, river restoration and stream bank, stream bank stabilization projects that contribute sediment to the river from persistent erosion sites. And I'll discuss a few of those projects which were mentioned previously by both Eleanor and by Gordon. Um, as for the issue of lower base flows in the summer where we saw those the dried up Lake Purdy, this is another effect of urbanization and new impervious surface in the watershed. More water running off over those hard surfaces means less is infiltrating into the ground, which feeds our springs and our groundwater that keep our rivers full, full of water. Our advocacy around green infrastructure, nature-based solutions to stormwater, and green space preservation all contribute to base, restoring base flows in the Cahaba and its tributaries. Next, we've helped Jefferson County and EPA to identify project locations where capacity, storage, or repair improvements can be made to the sanitary sewer system to reduce the frequency and volume of sewer overflows, which have plagued our communities for decades. We're also advocating for updates to the models that better predict in the impact of climate change on their systems. And finally, as we heard from Gordon and our stewardship folks, we're protecting our native biodiversity by mapping and targeting invasive species in our watershed, including removing taro or elephant ears as some others call them, um, in Cahaba Lily Habitat near the National Wildlife Refuge and near our drinking water source here in Birmingham. Next slide, please, Katie. As I mentioned, we're, we're pressing for engineers, developers, and municipalities to include green stormwater infrastructure and nature-based solutions into their development designs. Simple, simple um, features like curb cuts, bioswales, and rain gardens, and perme permeable pavers are just a few ways to trap and treat more stormwater before it runs off. Next, please. 2021 also ended with successful partnerships with the Nature Conservancy, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, multiple homeowners associations and um, communities to plan large scale river restoration projects in both Hoover and Trustville. These projects are in early stages, but we expect them to get off the ground and, and start solving some real problems. Next slide, please, Katie. We're also piloting small scale stream bank stabilization efforts um, with volunteers and individual property owners to re revegetate these areas. Um, the first of these was completed in September along Shades Creek and the Shades Creek Greenway. And I'll put a chat, a link in the chat for a video explanation um, of what Eleanor brought up before made by the Friends of Shades Creek. Uh, next, please, Katie. And to accompany this effort, we're finalizing a guide for landowners with tips and tricks for protecting and restoring riparian buffers in a way that won't break the bank. So look for that in early 2022. Next, please, Katie. And here's just a few photos of the work being done to help identify persistent sanitary sewer overflow sites throughout the watershed. We continue to press for prioritization of projects in areas that will, one, have the greatest impact on volume and frequency of overflows, that are protective of human health and the environment, and two, um, that these sites are selected and applied e equitably to the communities who are most burdened by the legacy of environmental injustices. Um, next slide, please, Katie. And finally, in 2021, we had some success um, helping residents and governments identify and manage um, ongoing sources of sediment pollution. Um, in 2021 alone, we, we helped facilitate discussions between 25 different citizen outreach requests and governments to find a remedy um, with, the, with the relevant municipality. Um, and finally, before I, before I give this up, um, I wanna thank those on this call who assisted this summer um, by submitting photos to change water quality designations in our state. Those, those photos and those stories um, went a long way to convincing um, the state and the EPA to better protect our watersheds. But that's all the time I have. Um, please, please reach out to me with any questions. 
um, concerns you're seeing out there in the watershed or just to introduce yourself. Um, I'll drop my contact info information in the chat, but we'll move on in our in our program. Up next is our development director, Casey Laycock. Thank you, Ben. And the work we've been able to achieve and the celebrations you've been able to watch today would not have been possible without you, um, all of you on here tonight, uh, today, I should say. We want to thank all of our donors, members, sponsors, foundations, and businesses that have supported our mission and really lifted us up and stayed the course with us during these turbulent times. Uh, if you are not a member, we ask that you consider joining us today by visiting us at our website, cahabariversociety.org. And if you are a business, there are many ways you can support us, like hosting your own fundraiser, like Aveda Salon and Institutes during Earth Month 2022. They're hosting a, an array of different fundraisers this year, which we're uh, very excited and thrilled to be a part of as well as the Regulators Bike Rally, which is coming up in March, um, even the Cahaba Brewing Goodwill Games and Alabama Outdoors Party on the Porch. Even individuals like Feathered Friends um, gifts have helped us this year. Uh, or you can consider sponsoring our 2022 Friday, which is coming up in October, the uh, October 2nd. It, you can also support us by purchasing your very own Save the Cahaba car tag or considering becoming a planned giver of our legacy program and strengthening our programs for generations to come. Please contact us directly for more information on all these ways to get involved and make a difference. And now I'm going to turn it over to our president of the board, Dr. Anthony Overton. Thank you, Casey. Uh, I want to um, just take a moment. Congratulations, Jean, on your award. Gordon, on your retirement. Uh, you will be missed, but you're always welcome back. Uh, the EDI committee for stepping out there and acknowledging the disparities that are present in our people and watershed. Special thanks to Jim for sharing his message and Ben for the work that you're doing uh, here locally. And also special thanks to all the members of CRS who have been donated their time and, and their money. Uh, your efforts don't go unnoticed. So um, we really appreciate that. But for me, I have a personal thanks I'd like to give to the staff of CRX. Beth, Casey, Gordon, Ben, Latanya, Randy, um, Katie, Trisha. I hope I didn't miss anybody, but uh, folks, I can tell you that this group works extremely hard, and uh, really, it's been great working with them. It's better, even better, getting to know each of them. So I want to say thank you, and thank you for uh, the CRS members for attending and learning about what we do with your help and support. Um, please become, get involved. There's plenty of opportunities. You'll hear more about the bio blitz in late April. Uh, hopefully we'll have a live fry down this year. I'm prayerful about that for this coming year. So if you can stay, we have a question and answer section to about 1.30. I asked, we ask that you put your question in the chat. Um, um, and that concludes our annual meeting, our 2020 one annual meeting. Thank you very much. And um, the question, question and answer session is open. Wow, that was so impressive, y'all. We were only four minutes over time. Unbelievable. What an incredible crew you are. Beth, Golly. you should go into writing scripts. You're like really good at this. I, I don't know if you realize that, but that was pretty nice. <laughs> So glad. Well, I, I was really curious to hear more about the Camp Fletcher bio blitz. We didn't have time to really get into that. So um, if I can be indulged with a question, I'd love for LaTanya to tell us more about that project and about Camp Fletcher. And then we'll see what other questions we might have from the folks who are remaining on. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth. Uh, so Camp Fletcher is a phenomenal just area to be on. Uh, it was, um, how do I say this? 300 acres acquired by Pauline Bla Bray Fletcher uh, back in the 1940s. She created this camp for black boys and black girls to have a camp experience. And back then it was unheard of for a black woman to have that much land underneath her belt. Um, so with the history from the 1920s, 1940s till now, uh, the camp is still standing. It's still thriving. It's still, you know, doing summer camps. 
uh, they, they're not doing overnight camps, of course, because of COVID, but also because of the capacity for no camp counselors to work overnight. So we have partnered with Camp Fletcher to put on a bio blitz. We did a preliminary one not too long ago in October. And now we're putting on a bigger one that's gonna be April 29th through the 30th. And this is an opportunity not only to bring more people out to this hidden gym that nobody <laughs> really knows about except for the folks who continue to go to camp but it's an opportunity to build relationships to help increase uh, diversity in that camp and also to help them with their outdoor education program and we would love for you guys to register and be a part of this wonderful group of folks that are coming out there to learn more about this 300 acre land the history is phenomenal and if you are interested in learning more please contact me uh, register and um, I look forward to hearing from you soon. And, Thank you. and I can't recall if this was mentioned, it, you may have mentioned this and I missed it, that um, uh, the camp is on Shades Creek. Uh, there's a beautiful stretch of Shades Creek and a, a very nice tributary of Shades Creek. And we did a preliminary bio blitz in the fall. And in just three hours with about 20 of us, we found uh, 70 species of plants and animals and aquatic creatures there uh, it shows you the incredible biodiversity of this beautiful place and we're going to be having um, not only the bio blitz activities if you want to come and stay for uh, for a while um, and be a part of uh, on the 29th in the evening bats and moths and then Saturday during the day all, all the critters and all the plants then in mid-afternoon we're going to have a special focus time that is great for education for kids we're going to have uh, eco poetry and um, and uh, nature art workshops, as well as seeing the creatures that have been found and tours of the camp. So um, y'all think about coming and joining us. We'd love that. Okay. Yes, Scott, we would love for you to come and do birds for the bio blitz. Thank you, thank you. You can, you can uh, follow the link and register and we'd love for you to come, bring whoever you'd like to. I know Sanford's bringing like three classes, including students. So it's, uh, we're, we love having um, our professors bring students as well, if you want to do that. And we had a question. Let's see, let's see what our questions are. Uh, Anthony, I think our questions start with Emily Magda's question. Yes, I have that, yes. So the question is, uh, is the CRS EDI committee collaborating with local government officials to implement environmental and water quality equity-based policies for the Birmingham area or uh, is achieving water quality uh, equity inhibited by private organizations like the Birmingham Water Works Board? Well, I can start out on that. And then if others want to jump in, um, we can do that. Um, that. That question really gets to the heart of what are we going to do with all this learning? And um, that's a big reason that we're doing the work of the EDI committee during this year is to understand the various water equity issues much more deeply than we had before and to see where the Cobber River Society can be most effectively involved. Where can we make a difference? And also, where are there other organizations, uh, partner organizations working on these water equity issues that we can help support them and help them be successful? Um, obviously, we don't want to play in space that is being uh, uh, well cared for by other organizations. We want to strengthen organizations. So um, one example is by bringing Dorikas Cooper onto our board of directors, it creates a much more direct link with uh, the person who's uh, you know, most involved in the city of Birmingham with all these issues around stormwater and flooding. Um, he uh, leads their watershed efforts and their stormwater efforts. And um, we're learning a lot from Dorikas and we'll see how we can help and be a part of that. Oftentimes we're working with other nonprofit partners uh, like Sweet Alabama um, and the Dynamite Smith Hill, uh, Dynamite Hill Smithfield Land Trust, Community Land Trust Organization in Birmingham uh, that we're working with about um, water affordability at the Water Board. Um, uh, you know, the, the Birmingham Water Board, we're, we hope that they will uh, be open to becoming much more aware of water equity issues 
and we'll, uh, we were disappointed last fall when they uh, increased the water rates and zeroed out their budget for community assistance program to help with water bills. And um, so there's a lot of dialogue and communication and cross education needed there. And we um, hope to be able to work with those board members and staff to move them to greater equity. Um, do others have some response to this question? Others from EDI committee or the staff? All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Jean, can you bring your kiddos out to the bio blitz? Absolutely, yes. My kids came out. There'll be plenty for them to do. Uh, let's see here. I think we addressed your question, Scott. Do we need any? Let's see. I think there's been information posted about the bio blitz there in the chat. I'm just scrolling down. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, and Janet Ord asked about having her high school students from Hoover helping with the bio blitz. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> the more the merrier. My kids came in. Even my wife came. She's not an outdoors person. And she was just going to drop the, me and the kids off. She stayed the entire time. So, I mean, it's it, it says a lot about it. It was really a fun time. So please try to support that event. We'd love to have your students there. Um, I can share the bio blitz with HICA. Thank you very much, Hispanic Alabama. Please do share that with uh, the HICA and other organizations. That's from, uh, I bet that's from Raquel, who's uh, just joined our board today. And we're really yes. excited about um, uh, how their various youth leadership groups can be involved in some of our programs. Okay. Let's see here, I'm down to the end. And just wanna make sure I hadn't missed any questions. Thank you. Great. All right, I don't see many more questions in the chat. Anybody just want to raise your hand and and share thoughts or ideas with us or or you know be a so part that, of the conversation? Can I pretend like I'm a new CRS member? So if I'm just incoming to just coming to CRS, where could I be most useful as a CRS member? Okay, I'm gonna let uh, the staff answer that. Um, uh, I'll let y'all just popcorn in. Ben, where, where do you think people would be helpful? I think if someone is brand new to CRS, um, look out for our educational and recreation trip schedule and join us for a, join us for a lily trip or a, a moonlight paddle or something like that. That's a great way to get introduced to the staff and to the volunteers and to some of the people who are participating in a lot of programs. Um, and we would just love to love to have you on something like that. I'll say something for a stewardship committee, anybody who's interested in volunteering, send a message to um, uh, CRS and the stewardship committee. And we'd love to let you know more about some of our projects and adventures, uh, sign up for the bio blitz. And that's a great way to get involved and get to know people and find more volunteering opportunities. Will, do you want to say a word? I'll put you on the spot. Will will begin on Monday as our field programs director leading our volunteer programs. Yeah, I'm really excited to be a part of the, the program and the process. And I definitely second Ben, just find our schedule and show up to an event and <clears throat> make your name known and you know we'll add you to our list and get you out for every other event we have after that. I think that's a great way to join in. And I'll add in too, Beth. Um, we need our new members to be our eyes and ears on the river. We learn so much because we don't know everything that's going on um, on the Cahaba or on any of the waterways in the Birmingham area. So if you see something, let us know. Um, we would be greatly appreciate. We would greatly appreciate the information of Absolutely. what's going on. That see something, Country. say something. You can yes. even send us a message through our Facebook Messenger if you just don't have an email address. So all that information is super helpful to to Ben and to Will and to to our entire team, so that we can get on it as fast as we can. And I'll put in that um, uh, if you don't have a Cahaba car tag. Um, that's just an incredible uh, source of support for us. 
that didn't go down during the pandemic. It's held steady through whatever economic ups and downs are happening. And for us to have that regular source of support we can count on is so valuable. Plus it's such a beautiful car tag. So um, that's a wonderful way to support us as well. Yes. Thank you, staff. And Will, I want to acknowledge you as part of the staff. I went down my list. I realized I didn't have your name on it. And I apologize. I charged it to my mind, not my heart. Technically, you're right. I'm not staff yet. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Well, well, still, you've been at work in the background, but I just wanted to make sure to acknowledge you. I appreciate that. All right. Any other questions? I don't see any. We'll give it a few more minutes. I would like to say if um, our members and, and, and folks who love the Cahaba River Society, if you're involved in church groups, if you have children who go to schools, share our clean information. We would love to take your students out to the river and teach them about the rich biodiversity of the Cahaba and more. Um, there's also opportunities for internships and also junior board opportunities as well. Um, so please, if you're interested in learning more about that information um, and send us an email, but also there's high school internship opportunities as well if you have any younger folks. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from you soon. Yeah, I, I'm really glad Latanya reminded us of that. Um, it's our goal to have the funding to have intern crews for um, to support our stewardship programs uh, every year. And we had just a fantastic intern team last year. Will was one of our a shining star among shining stars of that intern team. And uh, it's a great way for us to be able to encourage young leadership and diverse young leadership. So um, particularly those of you who are associated with universities, um, you know, send interns our way and we would love to find uh, ways to get them all engaged and to, as Kenya said, really look at the career opportunities that are there in the environmental field. All right, so plenty of opportunity for you to become involved in CRS for sure. <laughs> throw out one more way that you can get involved. If you want to help celebrate Gordon, which I am so happy about how festive he looks surrounded by balloons, um, <laughs> that that worked out very well. Uh, we'll be at some point, we'll be having what we hope is an in-person celebration of his retirement, maybe something outdoors, but he's he's retiring slowly a little bit at a time. So, so we've got a minute to plan that, but we, have started a fund um, for Gordon, uh, uh, Gordon Black Legacy Fund that you can contribute to that will help with um, scholarships for youth for our clean program and other important things like maybe some new, new canoes for our program. I'll drop a link to that fund in the chat if anyone would like to make a donation in Thank honor. Thank you, Katie. Katie, um, I, I wanna point out that several people on this call have made ridiculously generous yes. donations to that fund. And I am so appreciative. The work that they're, that's gonna pay for is truly valuable, is truly important. And it's, it's really exciting to see the support for that. And a further comment, you know, if anybody wants to know how to get involved in CRS, we could use some volunteers right now to try to dig me out of these balloons. This is a <laughs> lot of balloons. I don't think I can get out of my desk. Hey, those balloons look good on you, Gordon. I have a quick question. Is there a link on Facebook or on CRS website to that fund? There is, Jean. If you look at the CahabaRiverSociety.org homepage, where it says get involved, if you put your mouse over that part of the menu, you can see links to, we have two legacy funds. One is for Dr. Randy Haddock, who's also here in this meeting today. And the other one is for the Gordon Black Legacy Fund. You can see both links to both of those funds where you can go to donate. Thank you for asking Jean important questions on how to donate.
Boy, Jean is certainly an incredible example of how to get involved. Uh, she has, you know, just made such a difference of got, getting so many people in Trustful involved because of all the different events, cleanups and other things that she's organized, all the work she's done. It's been wonderful to have you with us today, Jean. Thank you, this has been fun. You guys are awesome. All right, if there are no further questions, we are always available to answer any of your questions, Facebook, through the website, give us a call. We're there, but uh, Beth, you think it's fine for us to uh, conclude our annual meeting at this point? I do, and gosh, thank you, everybody. There are just so many wonderful board members and new board members uh, here, so many longtime members and new members. Um, just, we are so deeply appreciative of you all. Um, we're an amazing family, um, and we get a lot done together. I don't, I don't know any organization that has such a hardworking board as ours. Only I shouldn't call it hardworking, it's fun working. Mm -hmm. I think y'all all have a good time doing this. Um, and we just so deeply appreciate you so much. Thank you.